the e Science Institute, she's a data scientist there. Her background is quite different from us. She'll tell you about the research she does. Um, and she has a lot of experience with cloud computing, and in my opinion, she works on one of the most exciting projects in science today, which is very much uh, in the cloud. Uh, maybe she'll tell us a little bit about that as well. But, uh, okay, thank you. Oh, okay, great. Um, Okay, I'm just going to hold this far away. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Amanda Tan, and I'm a data scientist at the eScience Institute. Um, my background is actually in civil and environmental engineering. And uh, now I work on um, a, a project um, that Ariel was referencing called Pangeo, um, which stemmed out of trying to get large um, climate data sets, um, trying to get data out of large climate data sets and trying to process them on the cloud. Um, so the Pangeo project um, actually uses what you use um, throughout this, this week you've been using something, Jupyter Notebooks on a Jupyter Hub, um, but what it does is that in the back, it has a whole bunch of machines churning on the cloud, trying to make sense of this huge data sets. And when we were talking about huge data sets, if you think about climate models um, over many, many years, that's um, tend to amount to petabytes of data. Um, so that's one of the exciting projects that I'm working on. But um, today, I'm actually going to um, talk more about um, some cloud computing fundamentals um, and just to get a sense of uh, you know setting a tone for the rest of this tutorial um, how many of you have used some kind of cloud computing service oh great so um, I, but I'm just gonna go through this like kind of uh, you know briefly and then we will actually um, there are three things we want to achieve today. One is to actually learn how to deploy a um, virtual machine or actually rent a server on the cloud on AWS. We're gonna use Amazon Web Services today. Um, you're probably familiar with other cloud providers, um, namely Microsoft Azure and Google Cloud Platform. We will not be talking about that today, but I, um, essentially um, the way the services are provision or the computers are rented are the same. Um, the second thing we're going to learn is how to actually um, get a uh, something called an S3 or a object storage on the cloud so you can actually plug that into that computer that you have rented or deployed on Amazon Web Services and then um, Ariel is going to show you how to actually install some packages and then to actually start doing some data analysis. So as an introduction, um, why and when should we use the cloud? Um, I'm gonna give you a brief overview of what exactly is Amazon Web Services and um, when you might not wanna think about moving to the cloud. Um, so cloud computing, you know, it's, if you think about your Google Drive, you think about Dropbox, um, somewhere in the back, there are a whole bunch of computers um, working and storing your data and allowing you to access that data. That's what most people are familiar with when it comes to cloud computing. But here we're talking about being able to um, purchase a server. So traditionally, you have had servers that were under your desks, right? You would give it a name, you would have a system administrator giving you login passwords to a computer where you can then run a whole bunch of analysis. And some of you might be familiar uh, with it, known as clusters, or it's just a, a server in my lab. So traditionally, we call those servers kind of like pets, right? We give them names and we baby them. And when they, when they die or when they, you know, they, they cease to exist, we get really sad. But the cloud has kind of changed that paradigm. So instead of pets, um, computers now can be known as cattle. So if they are, if they die, you just take them out back. You, you know, you get rid of it, and then a new one comes up in its place, right? So this this mentality that the cloud cloud computing gives you. Um, computers in the sense of cattle, not pets. And you don't actually really give them names anymore. Um, so with that in mind, um, also the other thing of why you would use cloud computing is that if um, more and more data sets are actually moving to the cloud, um, you might not know that now, but if you 
kind of dig a little bit further, you would realize that a lot of the large data sets are moving to, to the cloud. So in my field, for example, we work with a lot of satellite data, and a lot of the government agencies are actually putting data on the cloud now. And if you actually think about computing where the data is stored, first um, you realize that you know it saves you a lot of time, and then also the other thing is it gets rid of a lot of the overhead and cost of having to download the data and to store the data, right? Um, and with cloud computing, we like to use this uh, image. This is actually, does anyone know where this image is from? The, yeah, this is the, the Red Queen, right, from Alice in Wonderland. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, an illustration of how, in the past, we have been kind of running in place, right? We have been trying to do the same thing over and over again. Um, you know, you download the data, you store the data. And if you think about it, like, the cyberspace is filled with replicated data in orders of, I, I, I saw, I saw a, um, graph not too long ago about like we are now in zettabytes of data and it's just like if you think about it like how much of this data are, have been replicated over and over again. Um, so if you think about there are six advantages of actually using the public cloud as a research platform. Um, one is that because if um, you think of computers on the cloud as cattle, not pets, you actually don't really have a wait time. You don't have to fight for resources with other people. You have all these huge amounts of computers um, waiting, waiting out there for you to rent, right? Um, Amazon has data centers, all these um, places where the computers are stored um, over many, many regions around the world. Um, and the other thing is that you actually don't have to purchase or maintain any of this hardware. Um, you, all you do is you log on to um, the console, right, an AWS console, you get an account and you can start doing your compute tasks, which is what we're going to learn how to do today. Um, and then you also pay for the resources and then when you turn those resources off, so we talk about resources, it's renting a computer or renting some storage space, um, you turn those off and you don't get charged anymore. Um, traditionally what you would do, for example, if you wrote an NIH grant or an NSF grant, is that you would put in a certain amount of budget and you would say, oh, I would use $3,000 to buy a computer. and um, I would use, you know, a thousand dollars for disk storage, but now with um, cloud computing, you actually just pay as you go. So, you know, if you end up using a hundred dollars a month, that's what you would write into your budget. Um, and then also, there's a huge community starting to expand cloud tools. Um, you've probably heard of the term cloud native. Um, that's that's. Um, a lot of companies and a lot of um, software developers are moving towards just building tools on the cloud. Um, and then lastly, one of the reasons why you would move to cloud also is that you have this almost infinite storage solution and the reliability and security that comes from um, working with big commercial vendors, right? Like AWS and Azure, they have these standards that they need to adhere to. So you have that added layer of um, reliability. Um, your data centers are, they always have to be up. You won't have to deal with that um, problem of, you know, if that server that's sitting in the basement somewhere in your department gets burnt out, you have to wait for your system as administrator to come and fix it. Um, and then also they just keep making new services and stuff. So you will see today when we log on to the AWS console, this whole wide array of services that's kind of frankly mind boggling, um, but it's just kind of fun. Um, but then there are also reasons why you wouldn't move to the cloud, right? So the cloud is not your one stop solution. Um, if you have identified a computing, like a research computing, um, architecture or you know something that works for you then there's probably no need to move to the cloud um, if you find that you know your your processes or your code is you're running out of memory you're running out of um, CPUs then maybe it's time to think about the cloud but if it's working for you then maybe you don't um, and also like learn like getting onto the cloud there is a huge learning curve it's not something where you you know can you could probably learn it in a day, but like really understanding how to develop um, 
you know, a processing pipeline is not, is not easy. So there is a learning curve and you need to take the time to do it. Um, and also, if you run your computer at a very, uh, you know, you run your code or your processing pipeline at a very high duty cycle. So if you're running your code 24 hours a day using lots of CPU, it might not make sense to move to the cloud. So there's a cost, um, cost trade-off. And um, also this is really relevant is that if there are lots of administrative hurdles for you, so for example, like trying to get around HIPAA compliance or FERPA compliance, then that's something to think about, about whether it would be worth your time and effort to move to the cloud. Um, so the next thing is that um, cloud adoption is really a framework. There are things that you, again, like I said, there are things that you have to know um, beforehand going in. So for example, like you would have to put in your credit card number when you're signing up for a cloud account. And there are potential for a lot of things to go wrong. So you could have put you know, some kind of um, key on, on GitHub, right? You, you could have uploaded your key to, keys to GitHub and somebody out there could have gotten those keys and ran up like a $13,000 debt on your uh, AWS account. So like trying to understand like how those things happen um, is something that you would want to take into account when you're, when you're adopting um, the cloud or you're trying to learn how to use the cloud. Um, and um, the other thing to keep in mind is that you know the cloud is, um, you're basically renting a service, right? So you're paying as you go, it's a utility. So you pay for what you use, and sometimes it's just easy to forget that you actually have those things going on, and you could run up a lot of money um, just doing that. So being mindful of those things are really important. Um, and um, so let's talk a little bit about costs. So I mentioned that uh, you, know, you could run all these things up and you not, not even know that. Um, so first thing is compute. So with the cloud, you have um, many, many types of compute that you can um, use the term provision, which is basically just rent, right? So you can rent a machine that has a size from two CPUs and eight gigabytes of RAM to something that has, you know, to GPUs to something that has, I don't know, 48 CPUs and hundreds and hundreds of gigabytes of RAM, um, but then that all comes with a cost. And um, for storage, is actually two cents per gigabyte per month. That's for um, storage that you have in something called an S3 bucket, which is an object storage, which we will talk about a little bit more. And then there is a cost of 10 cents per gigabyte per month if you have storage just actually on those machines that you rent. So like trying to understand um, these kinds of costs is something that you should take into account as well when you start learning how to work on the cloud. Um, then there are lots of other things like web services um, or when you want to have a database, right? Those are additional costs that you would have to take into account when developing on the cloud. Um, so the, the several things to learn about when you're, when you're thinking about moving your, your research to the cloud is that you need to understand at least a little bit about um, systems administration. You really, really need to know about cost. You need to know about security if that's required from you. So for example, it, you need to know like, okay, if I want to stop certain people from accessing this computer that I have, um, how do I work with networks or IP addresses? And you also need to know, um, you know, how much computing power do I really need? Because you don't want to rent a machine and end up using only a fraction of it um, because you would be paying full price regardless, right? Even though if you use only a quarter of that computing power that you have um, provisioned or rented, you would still be paying um, a lot more. And um, so uh, I've, I've been through this and then we are going to be, so at the end of the day, the question is, should I move to the cloud? Well, that's really up to you. And um, the other question is, which cloud provider should I choose? So today we're going to learn about Amazon Web Services. Um, there are other cloud providers out there like Google Cloud Platform and Microsoft Azure. And really what it comes down to is 
follow the money. So if you are getting a grant from the NIH and they stipulate um, that you should use Google Cloud Platform, then that's what you do. Um, most across all three cloud providers, they're pretty similar in terms of services and in terms of pricing. Um, there are some little um, nuances. So for example, like with Microsoft Azure, if you're using a program, a proprietary program, a software that requires you to have um, to use Windows, then you might choose Azure instead of the other cloud providers because you would then have to think about li licensing and how much those, that licensing costs. Um, and um, just very briefly here, I, uh, I have, and then we can stick that link into Slack um, if you want to follow along. Um, but also, like, what, what are there, like, little differences, other little differences? So in my opinion and my experience, um, if you are looking to get started on the cloud, the easiest would be Google Cloud Platform because um, if you log on to the console, it tells you, like, okay, you are now provisioning this machine and this is how much it costs. Whereas with the other two cloud providers, it's a little bit hard to get at the cost. So if this is your first time working on the cloud, it's really good. To, um, it's really helpful to understand like how much things would actually cost you. Um, okay, so um, do you have any questions for me? Otherwise, we're going to just move ahead with doing some fun stuff. Great. Okay. So um, I think, Ariel, you're going to send out the... Yeah, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start a new channel. I'm going to call it cloud. And we'll use that to the cloud related stuff uh, from now on. And what I'll do there is I'll drop the CSV file. In there. And that CSV file has a row for each one of them. And you'll know that it's your row because it has your GitHub username in the username column. And then it has a bunch of other columns. One of those columns is your password. Uh, so I'm sharing your password with everyone else. Fortunately, the first time you log in, you'll be required to change that password. So it won't be your password for very long. Uh, so please that. Um, let me just start this uh, cloud channel here. Find the credentials. So, okay, um, if you have your user, GitHub username and password, um, you go to um, console.aws.amazon.com. So console, that's the first one. I don't know, it's probably too tiny, but yeah. Where is the, where is the, uh, the CSV file? It's in the cloud channel. Sorry, where's the cloud channel? It's in Slack. Yeah, but I can't see it. If you go to the channels, look up channels and bring all the channels and then type the cloud. Who has found the CSV file? Any questions? 
Okay. All right. Okay. Oh, you can you can open it in your window and then you can just search for your Right. So if you actually have your username and password, you can go to console.aws.amazon.com and you would see a page that looks like this. And so the account ID would be UWE Science, and then you would put in your username um, and the password. Yeah, um, hang on. Ha, that's too big. There we go. So again, the account ID is UWE Science, um, the username that you have, and then the password. So for me, it's his. And then if you click sign in, you'd be asked to change your password. So please change it to something that you can remember. So we would get something that looks like this, and then you would type, put in your old password again, and then have a new password. Okay. Um, okay. Right, and if you're, if everything is working for you, you would see something that looks like this. Is anyone not here? <laughs> um. Okay, just to reiterate for those who are not there yet, it's console.aws.amazon.com. Oh, and I'm actually. Um, okay. And if you are ne still not there, you your account ID is UWE Science. Put in the username that you got from the spreadsheet, and then you would put in the password that comes from the spreadsheet, and you'll be asked to change your password for the first time. Oh, yay, all right, okay, good. Okay, so I'm assuming everyone's here, and if um, you're not, maybe Ar you can raise your hands and Ariel can come around and, and help you out. But I'm just gonna assume everyone's here, and the first thing we're going to do is um, launch uh, a virtual machine. So a virtual machine is basically renting space on um, one of the computers that they have in the AWS data center. Um, but before we do that, um, please make sure that you are here, right? Um, if you are on the top right corner, you will see um, this drop down menu here that has a list of um, geographic regions. So that's something called um, availability zones or regions. And we are going to go ahead and select um, US East Ohio 
basically what it what it is is that it rents or it deploys a machine on the cloud in a data center that is in that region that you selected so the reason why we're selecting Ohio is not because we're the nearest to Ohio it's because it's easy for me to clean up after this um, you would select um, the regions that you would select are based on a your your own location so it reduces latency of having you know um, data transfer and the other thing is if you are working with data sets that are already on the cloud um, you would try to get a machine that is located at the, in the same geographic region as your data right so it also reduces that cost there's a transfer small very minute transfer fee if you're transferring data in between regions so if let's say your data is in Oregon and you're trying to transfer it yeah sorry um, did you have a question Are, is there any concerns about data privacy? Um, in, not that I'm familiar with. I think it's governed. So, for example, what I'm familiar with in terms of like data security and privacy would be something like HIPAA, and that would be more of um, across the board, um, not region specific, but in ways that you lock down specific IP addresses or whether your data is transferred, whether it's encrypted or not encrypted when it's um, coming in and out of the system. Um, so, yeah. Is there any law that will change? Like, should it matter to me that the data is in Europe? I, well, it depends on what their requirements on their side are, right? If they're saying that, you know, if you have to, um, have some kind of security protocol in place, then you would have to abide by that. But with the cloud providers themselves, they don't stipulate whether or not you would adhere to any kind of security um, protocol. Ariel, want to chime in? I'm not a lawyer, but uh, sorry, I'll just state that. But it's my understanding that yes, there are in some places laws that require that prohibit the data leaving the certain region that is physical territory. But or going to certain physical territories is really more of a problem. Uh, the data in, in Amazon Web Services is stored literally in those physical locations. Right? So if you were a researcher in, in India, just for example, and the laws of India prohibited medical data from leaving the territory of India, you would be forced by those to comply. You would be forced to only ever use the Asia Pacific Mumbai region. Uh, if you were to do that, the, the data would always be physically in, in India. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it's so, so it's com it gets complicated. Though. Okay. Um, so, but we're going to select uh, Ohio for this uh, for this tutorial, and um, and yeah. So for the rest of uh, the neuro hack week two weeks, bi weeks. Um, if you wanted to use any of the services uh, that we've provided an account for, if you could keep them in Ohio, that would be really great. Um, and we're gonna go ahead and launch a virtual machine. And you would be on a page that looks like this. And we're going to scroll down a little bit, and we're going to provision um, an Ubuntu server. So Ubuntu is just a flavor of operating system, Linux operating system. We're going to select that. And you can see, if you're on this page, you can see choose an instance type, and you would see that there's a whole bunch of types. There's a family, family and a type. So um, each of these machines have a different CPU size and a different um, RAM size. And what we want to do is to choose a machine um, called M4.ExtraLarge. That's a pretty powerful machine. And we're going to scroll down and we're going to select it. And then 
It's a, we're going to select the M4 extra, dot extra large, um, which has four C, vCPUs and 16 gigabytes of RAM. And we're going to click Next and configure the instance. So again, M4 extra large, you scroll down a little bit more, you should get there. And then you select it and then you click configure instance. Um, okay. Okay. And we are going to keep the number of instances that we want at one. And then just to know a couple of these options. Um, so spot instances is, um, if you go on Google Cloud, it's also known as preemptible instances. It is Amazon basically renting you machines that are sitting there idle. So you're, um, it's just their way of cost management that if they have all these machines, tons and tons of them that nobody's using, they're gonna just rent it to you for really cheap. Um, so how it works is that you actually bid for those machines. So for example, an M4 extra large right now, if you just say, I don't care about the spot instance business, it's gonna cost you, I think about um, 45 cents um, per hour. But sometimes if you select, um, I want a spot instance, you can go as low as um, four cents per hour. So, but you, what you're doing is that you're um, kind of bidding, right, for that spot. And if the price, if somebody else bids higher and Amazon runs out of space, then they will actually kick you off those machines. Um, so it's also good to kind of know that, that it's a cost cutting measure for you, but to kind of dial that in into your code or into your pipeline to kind of have that um, error message thrown out when you're running these kinds of, uh, on these kinds of machines. But for this tutorial, we're actually not going to do that. And um, we're also going to just keep it at, uh, the network would be just a, Existing VPC, you can select um, this. Yes, sorry. Is there, is there a delay with that kickoff mechanism, or is it instantaneous? Like as soon as there's another bidder, you're off. Or is it there is there is a delay. They'll send you send you a warning, I think. Um, but it's one of those things where it's kind of. I think you actually have to have like Cloud Cloud Watch set up for that, um, which is another. So Cloud Watch is their monitoring uh, service, and you have to actually pay for that. I think. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, there's a little bit of a like an architectural thing that you have to do if you're doing spot instances. Um, yeah, so we're gonna make sure that we're at the existing VPC. And so VPCs are ways to kind of, we talked about HIPAA compliance, like keep machines in a certain network so only certain other computers within that network can talk to that computer so it gets really messy. So we're just gonna leave that VPC issue there. And we're also gonna say no preference for the subnet. Um, and we are going to keep the auto assign public IP uh, as use subnet setting enabled. Um, the one thing, okay, the one thing that we are going to talk about is IAM roles right here. Um, so this is important um, for you to know because um, if you recall earlier on, I mentioned about keys and GitHub. Um, so access keys are a way for uh, your Amazon resources, so like your v EC2 or your S3 buckets um, to kind of uh, talk to other um, Amazon services. So if you wanted to, let's say you've already have this machine, you, you're logging in and you're saying, okay, I wanna do something on my S3 bucket, I wanna put files on there, right? Um, you would need something called keys. Um, but a lot of times, these keys are really easy for you to just to, to get out. So for example, like you would code it into um, your Python, Python code, right? And you would not, not remember that and you would upload it to GitHub. And so once those keys get out, it's easy for other people to access all these services on AWS through your account. Um, and that's how people can actually run up tons and tons of money on your account. So the way that Amazon is trying to lock down on a lot of these issues is to use something called roles. And it gets rid of this need for you to kind of mess around with those access keys. And so here, what we're going to do is we are telling um, Amazon that the computer that we are provisioning now, it's okay because we are going to allow it to talk to S3. And if you scroll down through all this, huge list of 
roles, you would find something called NeuroHack S3 Full Access. It's basically saying that I'm giving the computer that I'm deploying or the computer that I'm creating full access to S3, which is the Amazon object storage. So you click on that and um, and then the one other thing that you probably need to know is shutdown behavior. So when you stop your instance, right, if you remember that we're renting a machine and it costs 45 cents per hour. But on top of the machine, you have a whole bunch of stuff that's built in. So you have something called a disk drive, and that disk drive is an additional charge of 10 cents per gigabyte per month. So if you have 100 gigabytes of storage, that would be 10 bucks a dollar. 10 bucks, yes, that would be 10 bucks a month. Um, if you stop that, the 45 cents goes away. You're not paying the 45 cents, but you are still paying that $10. Um, if you terminate your machine, it just means everything gets wiped off. So even your data and your disk drive, everything gets wiped off. You're not paying for it, paying for anything anymore, but you don't have that data sitting there anymore. So, but here we're just going to do um, a stop. We're not gonna terminate it. And um, that's it. And then the next thing we're gonna do is add some storage. Yes. So I'm gonna go back there. Um, the IM role is. Uh, yes, you can define a new one. Um, if you click here, you can click on create a new IM role. And it would bring you to a screen where it would say, um, I'm actually not gonna pull that up. But what it does is like you can give it a name and you can say, okay, now this machine can have S3 access and access to um, my database and access to these other services. So it's a, a way to lock things down. But yes, you can, you can do a new role. How do you define the machines? How do I define the machines? Um, sorry. So like, uh-huh. Yes, yeah, so uh, how you identify that the machine's yours. Yeah. Yeah, so each machine that gets spun up or deployed uh, will be assigned a very specific ID, um, and that's how you, you refer to it. You use it, that you know it's yours. So if we walk through all the steps, um, there are ways for you to actually assign a name to that machine as well so you don't get lost. Okay, so I'm assuming that everybody's done this. Um, I wonder if we're gonna, okay. And then we're gonna go add some storage. So just, just uh, very quickly, the storage, um, so you see here there's a root drive and it, you see there's a potential for adding new volumes. So if you think about um, this machine that you're deploying as your laptop, it's giving you the ability to actually add extra disk drives. Um, it's a good rule of thumb to keep your data separate from your root drive. Um, there, are mul there are multiple reasons for this, but the most importantly is that if you stop your machine or you terminate your machine, um, this root drive, a lot of times it goes away, so you kind of lose that root drive. But then what Amazon does is it detaches that additional data drive, right? So if you add a new volume, it detaches it and it keeps it. It doesn't destroy it, so your data's not gone. So if you're working with a huge amount of data, you would want to keep that separate because you don't want to have to download it again or, or um, analyze it again. Um, and what's on the root drive would usually be your um, core programs, so like your operating system, um, programs like Anaconda, Miniconda, things that you actually use, right? So those are like your core programs will be in your root drive. Um, but for this tutorial, we're gonna keep um, the size of your root drive at 25. And um, I think that's big enough, okay. And we are going to go to tags. So just changing the size here. And don't worry about that. Do you have any questions for me? Okay, all right. So next we'll add some tags. And then that goes back to, um, sorry, I didn't, I didn't get your name. Okay, it goes back to your question of how do we assign um, a name, right? So we are going to actually do that. 
we're going to go to add a tag. And so this is a key pair of value. Um, there are certain, so the way that Amazon keeps track of these things that you have are through this key pair of values. And if you go, if you start d delving a bit deeper into, you know, billing, um, you can see that you can assign very specific keys. They have a whole list of keys that you can assign to kind of narrow down services that you have. So for example, if we say name and we give it a name, so this will actually give a name to that, that machine that you have. So here we would use something like NeuroHack Manitan. So for you, it would be name is a key of um, name of your machine. The key is name of your machine. And then the value would be um, NeuroHack dash your username. So your GitHub username. So this, this key value here is very specific. It will only allow you to actually put in very, very specific values. So it would just be name. And then the next thing that it would have would be something like project, maybe. So it's just a way for you to keep track of you know, this, all this stuff that you've created. Um, and we would do something like Neurohack 2018. And so if you're collaborating with other people and you all use the same tag of like projects, that's how you know that all these instances or, or virtual machines are part of that project. Okay. Um, and then the next thing we're going to do is configure a security group. So when you, once you're done with those tags, we're going to do the security group settings. Um, so security groups are a way, so if you're familiar with um, ports, so it's a way for you to actually get into this virtual machine that you've, um, you've provisioned. It's a, it's a port, it's a hole that you, know, you get to go into. Um, so opening port 22 allows you to actually SSH in, which is what we're going to do. But we also want to add, um, actually, I apologize. Let's backtrack. Uh, we're actually going to select an, an existing security group because if all 65 people create an, a security, we're going to have 65 different ones. Um, if you select an existing security group, you can see here that we have, um, that's this one that's, uh, that I've already done, which is the NeuroHack security group. You can go ahead and select that. And you would see that um, there are two ports that are uh, listed here. One is the port 22, which is for SSH access. And then the other one is 8888 to 8889, and that's for your Jupyter Notebook. So you, you will be learning how to actually get Jupyter Notebook to run from the cloud. So um, if you select that, um, that would be the security group. And then you would, the next step would actually be launching that virtual machine. And you would probably run into a bunch of errors like this, which is fine to ignore. Okay. And if you click launch, um, so this is one step that you sh really shouldn't gloss over, uh, because if you miss this step, you won't be able to log onto that machine. So what you want to do is to create a new key pair. And this key pair is the way that you would SSH into your virtual machine. So SSH is secure shell tunneling. Um, so from your actual computer, that's how you would actually talk to the computer that you have on AWS. Um, and we we're, we're going to give it a key pair name. So here I am going to do NeuroHack Amanda Tan. Just to make sure that I can find Please start your, all your keys with NeuroHack. And then before anything else, please download the key pair um, and then make sure you know where you're downloading it to. So I, for me, usually it just ends up in my downloads folder, but it might be on your desktop or, or somewhere. So just save that file um, and click OK. And then once you're done with that, you can launch the instance.
We requested 75 of them. No! What's that? No, it's okay. I thought we requested 75 of them. Yeah, mine, mine works. <laughs> Yours works. Mine is not launching. Okay. Oh, good lord. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Just hit retry. <laughs> oh, great. Awesome. Thank you. Good tip. <laughs> retry. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Right. And if you successfully retried, launched, um, sorry, I felt like somebody had a question. Yes. Oh, um, you would create uh, create a new key pair. If you're on that page, just create a new key pair, give it a name, neurohack dash your username, and then download the key pair. I don't see that here. What, what do you see? What do you see? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Is anyone? Okay. All right. Um, Yes. It only charges you when the computer is running something. So the question is, how do you get charged, right? You charge all the time or you charge only when you're running something? So you, only when you're running something. The caveat being... I mean, the, it, could, it started charging right now, right? I think... Is that, is that a question? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I think the answer is, as long as the machine is on, as long as you haven't turned it off, it doesn't matter if, if you're running anything. But if you, like, let's say I, I just went through and did some pricing quotes on the US just because I was curious. And there was things like a couple thousand bucks a month for like 128. Would that be like a month of use time? Yes. It is a month of use time. So it starts, the clock starts ticking. So from here, right, you're launching it and it's running. So what it counts as running is not whether or not you have programs on there, it's running from the moment you say, start the machine, launch the instance, to the point that you say stop. Um, and on the calculator, they're a little bit tr tricky with it because they, they have something like util um, utilization rate of like 100% or 50%, right? So 100% would mean that you're running that instance 24 hours a day for the entire month. Um, and a lot of times you actually don't end up running that instance, um, that machine for, for that long of time. Um, the caveat that I was going to actually really point out is that when you attach a drive, so if you remember we had that 25 gigabytes of disk storage, that gets charged if it's just sitting there. If you have, you have a machine to stop, you're not getting charged for the machine, but you, you are getting charged for that disk storage. I assume it's probably a lot more. Yeah, I mean, it depends. Uh, if you, we have people that, you know, have a, a thousand, a, a terabyte of this space, right? And it doesn't matter if your your disk space is filled or you're only using point point one percent of that disk space, you're still charged for that one terabyte. Um, okay, All right. Okay, so if you're here, um, we are going to click on that ID. So somebody asked about. Um, you know, how do you know that a machine is yours? You're assigned a unique ID, your instance is assigned a unique ID, and if you click on it, you should be able to see all these details about that machine. And if you are not on this page and you're wondering how to get back to this page, um, you can go to services and you can see all these services that AWS has, and you can go to EC2 and you can see that it's 41 running instances. And if you click on those running instances, oh my god, okay, refresh. Okay, oh, good, keep refreshing.
Okay, well, I think we kind of broke AWS, but um, I think it's freaking out. But I'm just gonna I'm gonna go back to here. I can see that. Yeah, you can see that. Okay, so. You should be able to see, if you click on those 41 instances, you should be able to see a long list of, of um, instances. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to point out was that if you did not assign a name, it would probably be blank. So in that key pair value tags thing, if you didn't put a name and say neurohack dash uh, your username, this will be blank. And so you can see how it would get really, really confusing if you didn't use tags. It would just be a whole bunch of empty, um, spaces and you wouldn't be able to find your instance ever. Well, fortunately, you each named your key separately. So I know exactly who was the one because their keys are Okay. All right, RL is going to be the AWS police. Okay. Um, so if you can find your instance, you should be able to see all these details right here. You should be able to see your instance ID. You should be able to see um, the instance type that you have. And what we want is D are these values, right? We want these values. This is how you will actually um, get into those computers. This is the public facing uh, address for you to log onto the computer. Um, so right now, we are going to switch gears just a little bit. Um, related, but switching gears is to pull up your terminal. Oh, yes. 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 Just keep refreshing. Um, yeah, I think because we're many people who are hitting some limit yeah, on the website. Yeah, I tried that a couple times. I'm not getting Did you need to get back to your instance or? Oh. Okay, great. Okay, well, maybe just keep trying. Refresh. Yes. I'm not seeing the information on your description. When you click on the this, you have to kind of click on this little check mark here. Um, yeah, if you don't, if it's not selected. You won't see it. So I am seeing uh, the description field, but among the entities there, public DNS is not one of them. Oh, um, so that there's a couple of reasons why that might happen. Is one is that when you were launching the instance, um, perhaps the uh, there was an auto assign public IP. So we wanted to enable that. If you didn't enable that, this um, value would be empty. So maybe walking through the steps again. And just in case um, you either were, you couldn't follow along, um, all the steps are actually on that um, GitHub uh, page. So it's just basically just follow through that and you should get you through. Otherwise, um, I'll be here after this if you have questions. Um, but in the interest of time, we're, we're just gonna move along. Um, so these are the values that you would need, and um, we're going to switch gears, and we're going to pull up the terminal. So if you're on a Mac, you would have a uh, terminal, or if you're on Windows, you would have um, git bash. Okay, and uh, so, and um, I'm assuming that every everyone's familiar with using Unix commands. Um, we are going to go look for the key that we downloaded. So for me, I would go into, I would change um, directories into where I downloaded my key. Um, so I would go into my downloads folder and I would list in reverse chronological orders things that I've downloaded. And I would see that I have um, this right here, which is my key. And I want to change permissions for this key. So AWS requires us to actually lock this key down even further to only allow you to read that key. So we want to do something like this, which is change permissions. Um, let me just pull this up. So it's chmod 400 and then the name of the file. Um, okay. All right. So see again, chmod four hundred. Then the name of the file, and if you do that ls command again, um, so for me I like doing ls um, 
long list and then reverse chronological order, um, you would see that it's changed from something that looks like this, right, to something that looks like only one bar. Okay, and then um, if you've done the CH mod, we're going to go back to our console and we're going to click on this connect button. Right. And it gives you an example of how you can actually log on to your, to your instance, to the computer that you've provisioned. And I'm just, I'm going to copy this command. And I'm going to stick it into the terminal. Stick it in there. And ideally, again, once you've done the CH mod 400, um, you would go back to your AWS console, you would click on connect, it would bring you to a pop up that looks like this. You would copy the SSH command and you stick it back into your terminal. And if you click on enter, it would ask you, Are you sure you want to continue connecting? And you would say, Yes. Oh, um, here. Let's get it on this. So up here. Different question. Um, yeah. So I wanted to give a different computer access to the same account. Can I just copy that key file over to the CH mod there? Yes, you can do that. Caveat. Um, it's not good practice to actually do that. So if so we talked about learning curve for systems administration, right? What would actually be good practice would be for you to log on the computer, set everything up, and then give that person a Unix login, um, create an account for them on the computer, and then get them to log in. Because you really don't want to share keys. Like, um, and ideally, these keys are something where Good practice is to not share those keys, and you would try to create user accounts on the computer. If I'm the first person, like I have different, like I have a virtual machine somewhere else that I like to work from. Short answer: Yes, you can do that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Whatever you do with passwords, you can do this. All right. Um, yeah, it's just being pedantic, but anyway. Um, okay, uh, so we're going to go back here, and it will say yes. And if all goes well, you should see something that looks like this. Could I get a show of hands of who's not here? And is there something I can do to help? What was the last thing we did on the connect? Um, the last thing, okay, I'm going to exit. Just feel free to ignore this. Um, exit. Okay. All right, so the last thing I did on the command line was actually stick in that SSH key. Um, and then just go ahead and enter. You should, if you're logging in for the first time, you should have something asking you about fingerprints or something like that and you would just you would say yes that should get you here yes I, I'm so sorry like I have one ear that's not functional uh-huh Oh, so that 4% is your operating system. So you have operating system, you have all these little things that are, you know, that are pre-built. That's only okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then what we want to do is actually to update this entire system. So we would use something called sudo um, that gives you administrative access to this computer. And you would do sudo apt update.
This is better. So the app update, okay. Okay, and it should run for about a couple of minutes. So it's, again, a pseudo apt update, pseudo apt update. And the next thing we wanna do is pseudo apt upgrade. So we want to upgrade all these files. So what it does is actually updating a machine. Basically, that's, that's all it does. And um, it would ask you, do you want to continue? And you go, yes. So sudo app update, sudo app upgrade. And then we're going to do some fun stuff after that. Sorry. Yes. Okay, and everybody's here. Who's not here? Yes. Oh, this is probably like slow internet. So some something's out of our control. It's the internet. Um, okay. All right. So if you're here, you've done sudo app up, update upgrade. Then we're gonna do. We're gonna actually install the AWS command line. So the command line is a way for you from your terminal to actually talk to AWS. So instead of having to use the console, you just do it from your terminal. Um, and we are going to do sudo apt install AWS CLI. you click enter um, and it would ask you all these stuff yes I want to install this then I'll go through so it's sudo app install AWS CLI and it will take a take a bit okay So if you're still um, a little bit away from this, this is this other three commands you're supposed to. Oh, um, sudo apt upgrade, sudo apt update, up, sudo apt update upgrade install CLI AWS CLI. Um, up a date and upgrade and then control C. Yeah. Alright. Okay. Great. Okay. Alright. Um, and if you install everything, you should um, if you type AWS, you should see something that looks like this if everything has gone according to plan. Okay, great. Nodding heads, always good. Okay, great. Um, so what we want to do actually is to learn how to, how to create an S3 bucket. So um, is everybody familiar with S, um, object storage versus file storage? Okay, just very briefly for those who, who actually, um, who don't, who are not familiar is that object is, it's like his name, right? It's object, it's entire. So if you think about a file, like a Word document, if you go in and you change something on your Word document, what it actually does, it is it doesn't save the entire file altogether. It doesn't save, you know, 3,500 lines of words. It just saves those little changes that you make. So that's a file. But for object, um, if you make a change, it would save the entire thing over again. So if you can think about it um, in that way, uh, you can, you will come to the realization that object storage, when you make changes, like reading or writing, is really slow. 
um, but it also makes it uh, more cost effective for you to store things like that. So like images can be stored as objects, so that's cheaper. So that's why we use things like S3 to store um, these huge files where you're not changing stuff all the time. But if you're changing your files all the time, you wouldn't want to store it on S3. You would want to store it on your local drive because for, it's faster for you to read and write the files. Okay. Um, and so we are going to actually create an S3 bucket, and we're going to use this command, AWS S3. So AWS um, is calling S3. It's going to make a bucket, and we're going to give it a name called NeuroHack- You're going to put your username in there. And if you click Enter, it should work. Oh, darn. Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, I apologize. I missed this. So we want to do S3 colon slash slash. You're right. Um, apologies. That should work. Yes. OK. So again, it's uh, S3 colon slash slash. Your hack dash your username. Great. Okay, um, and then we are going to try to list all the buckets that are. So when you do a list, it's going to list out all the buckets that are actually on the account. So there is going to be hundreds of them. Um, so let's give that a try. Um, and you do, sorry, the command was AWS S3 LS. So it's basically emulating a lot of the Unix commands. Um, it's AWS S3 LS, and you would see that there's a whole bunch of, of buckets that have popped up, and you see all these newer hack buckets right here. Um, AWS S3 LS. Um, OK, and then now we want to copy some files into that S3 bucket. Um, we're going to do something like this, AWS S3, CP for copy. Um, we're going to copy from S3 dot, S3 colon slash, 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 neurohack dash Amanda Tan. So this is actually not going to be copying from your own bucket. You want to copy stuff from my bucket into your bucket. Um, so you're going to copy stuff from neurohack dash Amanda Tan to your own bucket, which was Something like this, right? What's the target? So the target is um, AWS S3 SCP from my bucket, from the from the from the bucket you're copying from to then the target bucket. So it's target. So it's target. Yes, last is target. Source target. Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, so the, if that all goes well, that should work. No errors. And then I'm going to list the contents of my target bucket. Okay. So it'd be again S. AWS S3 LS S3 target bucket. No. Slash. Slash. Okay. No. Uh oh. You want, you want the one <laughs> I want stuff with, I want a bucket with stuff in it. Yeah, let me tell you where there's a bucket with stuff in it. Oh, okay. Sorry, we, we're copying empty buckets everywhere. Um, we actually we actually need to work with some data. Um, uh, yeah, we oh, why is that then? Huh? Did I? Do we have permissions? I do. Do you? Did that work for you? It didn't work. So if I list the one, I get. Um, you, I'm assuming these are diffusion files. Yep. Yeah. But if I copy it and then list mine, there. Ah, okay. Let's try another trick. Um, let's do this. Let's do at dash dash recursive. 
Oh. Oh. What? I. It looks. <laughs> okay. I like everything's freaking out. Um. You know what I suggest? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Then we can help people. Yeah. We're gonna take a five-minute break. Okay. Uh, we're gonna continue. So uh, what we previously did, uh, I'm gonna clear this and then pull up the last command that I ran, uh, which was S3 CP. Um, here. This was the last command I, I ran um, before our break, um, and nothing showed up in my S3 bucket. Because when you copy A, it's not recursive, and C, B, B is um, um, copy would work best if you're trying to copy one file at a time. Um, sorry, what was your name? Antonia. Antonia. Antonia pointed out that if you use AWS S3 sync, it would sync um, the source and target uh, buckets together. Um, so you could use something like this. So AWS. S3 sync, sync um, the tar the source bucket and the target bucket, um, and that would work. Uh, the other thing you could do is AWS S3 CP um, source bucket target bucket dash dash recursive. Um, so you could either use use either command. So for this, you would, if all goes well, it would look something like this. It would be trying to copy a whole bunch of files. You could also use um, this command. That should also work. So either one. And if you have copied, um, when you pull things up, you should see something that looks like this S3 LS. So this is my bucket that I'm copying into. And I have a bunch of files there. Is anyone not here? Because Ariel is going to take over and, we, um, and he would need to have those files in this bucket. Great. Awesome. Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks, Amanda. So great. We now uh, we now have uh, some data in an S3 bucket, and we'll. So next, um, I'm actually going to do this thing. So this now is uh, th these these files are in your bucket. So you can do you know verify that by looking at neurohack dash aerochem or whatever your username is. It'll, it'll show you those things. You can also go to the console and um, go to the console to the, the AWS console. Go to S3 and. Now you'll see that uh, if you search for buckets, first there's a lot of buckets starting with NeuroHack, and the second is if you go to your bucket, you can examine these files, and in the console you can, yes, question. Say what? 
zoom in a little bit. Oh, yeah, sure. Nice. Uh, yeah, yeah. Is that better? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, and, I'll, and I'll do this little. So here you'll you'll see these files, and and in here you can you can edit all kinds of properties like the permissions of these files and, and things of that sort. You can even if files are in there, you can download them directly from from the bucket. How did I get to the bucket? Sorry, uh, I'll go back. Whoops. Uh, so in, in the, the main page of the console, I can always get back here if I click on this little smile up here. Um, I, type, I, I can type S3 in here. You'll notice there's uh, in here there are all the services that Amazon has, of which there are a myriad. Um, do all kinds of things. Alexa for business, for example. I don't know what that does. Um, so S3, and then uh, in S3, um, there are a lot of buckets under this account because it, it's all the projects that people in e at eScience do. Uh, so, but you can search here, NeuroHack. And there's mine, for example. And, and the data is in here. So you can go inside the console and manage uh, things there. Yes? Mount S3 as a local drive. No, you cannot. No, this object store is sort of, it's not really a hard drive as, as such. It's not, it's not really a file system. It's an object store, so everything's there in this kind of, um, it, it looks a lot like a file system. If you put directories in here, you can create directories in there and add stuff under directories, uh, but that's just an illusion. It's really objects that are sort of blobby out there. Yes? Sorry, say that again? So when we bought the virtual machine, we chose Ohio as a location, ah, right? Yeah. And, but now it says US East. Is it just that our data is in a place on the virtual machine? Uh, that's, maybe I messed up. Is that for you as well in US East? <coughs> US East to Ohio. All is US East. Oh, yeah, this is Ohio. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, but this is North Virginia. That is the default, I believe, of AWS, and I think that we should have configured AWS before we did our, all our operations. If you don't configure, I think it does the default thing. So what we did is, well, we'll, we'll do another configuration step in a second, uh, but in, in the configuration, it asks you, what's, what default region do you want to use? And if you don't have that configured in your, in your machine, then it will do the default thing, which is to put it in Virginia. I guess I thought we had figured that at the very, very start. What we did is we started our machines, but then once we landed inside that machine, it was a clean Linux machine. It had no idea where it was. Right, when we called AWS, the AWS CLI, the AWS CLI looked around inside that machine and said, do I have a configuration file here that will tell me what the default region is? There isn't one. Okay, let me just do the default thing. I'll show you that in, in about a minute. I'll show you how to configure so that you can, um, so you can get control of that. Um, yeah, that was not intentional. Um, okay. So the data is there, I can, and I can, I can, if I want to do compute with this data, I need to get that data to where there's a CPU. On S3, there's no CPUs, it's just lots of space to store stuff. One way to get that to a CPU is to get it onto this machine that has a CPU and do computing. So I can do AWS S3 uh, copy uh, S3 neurohack. Aerocam dot, which is to here, recursive. So again, I have a source and a target. Uh, the source is, is my bucket. Dot is, is the right here, the, the name of the, the place you're in, right? You know, right now on your file system. And so when I, when I did that, and I, I added the recursive flag, dash dash recursive, it recursively copied everything, and I now have the files on my machine. 
So that's, that's one way to get the files to a CPU where can, you can do compute. Now remember, this is a, we got this machine with nothing on it. It's, it's uh, completely tabula rasa. It has no, um, no useful software on it. So we have to go and install useful software. Yes? What have we paid for so far? So we have storage, or are we also paying right now for the time yeah. we're on it? Yeah. Okay. So far we're paying for two things. One is S3 storage. We're paying about two cents for 10 gigs per month, month, yes, month. And then we're paying Currently. for this machine. Sort of just like playing around. Yeah, so for that we're, I think it's like um, the order of, uh, what I'm using has eight, eight CPUs and 32 gigs of RAM, and that's roughly, if I remember correctly, roughly a quarter per hour okay. to run. So like, once we got in on it, when did, when did we start? We started when you, you remember that part with the key that you downloaded and afterwards you got like a launch button yeah. and then it came up with like a green thing, your machine is now launching, that's when it started paying. Okay. So the goal is to get in and get out. Yes, yeah, so I'll show you a way to really quickly get in and get out without ever logging into the machine in, in a few minutes. Uh, yeah. So okay, so we want to get some useful software on here. Uh, you've seen uh, many useful ways to get software, uh, you've already seen a uh, way to get software onto this. You could, uh, I don't know, download something from GitHub and install that. You can uh, install Docker onto this thing and Docker get a, a pull down a Docker image that has everything you want on here. I'll show you the sort of the, the very basic way of doing this. sudo, uh, whoops, sudo apt install python3 pip. So I'm installing the Python package manager pip onto this machine, um, and I'm installing the the Python three version of that. Um, uh, let me I'll paste that into the Slack channel as well. Uh, cloud. So I just did this sudo apt get install Python three pip. I actually did sudo apt install apt get and apt are synonymous, um, and that gets me the package manager, so that's good. And then I can pip install stuff like pip, well I need to do pip3, it's a, we're in a weird transition time now. The default Python on this, on this machine, if I, type, if I just typed Python by itself, uh, it would have all kinds of confusion about that and you also have Python, oh, you can run Python3, you can run this and it would give you uh, Python3.6. Uh, it turns out it doesn't have really a Python default, huh? That's which is a weird thing, but so goes it. Um, uh, the transition period we're in is the the default Python on operating systems like this one are, is not yet Python three, but we would really like to use Python three for everything we do. So we install Python three pip, which gives us the command, then the command pip three uh, install. DiPy, for example, that's always a good idea if you have diffusion data, which is what we have there. So that goes then and collects all the dependencies and installs DiPy and all its dependencies on this machine. So that's neat. And maybe we want uh, PIP3 install IPython so that we have a nice interactive environment to work in. Um, and then we can go ahead and, and do stuff. IPython, uh, <laughs> that is odd. IPython 3 maybe? Ooh. Um, okay, sudo apt install IPython 3, that's weird. <laughs> Other people's computers, I, I don't know. Um, yes? Not necessarily. I'll, I'll show you in a minute. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay, let's see if I can get IPython up and running here. I, this is all to show you. This, this is you could do this, but that's not necessarily the best way to do things. Um, IPython three. Here I am. Okay. So and then this this is uh, like any other Linux computer. I can go in and import DiPy and uh, or import Nibabel as nib. That lets me nib dot load. Uh, 
my T1 weighted image here or something, and so on. And, and do computing, okay, fine. But, but there are all these objections over there, I'm paying for this, what's, uh, how, like, do I really need to install every time? And so there, there are two ways to think about um, saving the time, the, the system administration time here. The first way to think about this is the creation of what are called Amazon machine images. Uh, th well, this, I'll, I'll start from one that you've already seen before. The first one that you've already seen before is Docker. Get in there, get Docker, get your Docker image, it has everything you need, log into that Docker image and do whatever you need to do. That's one. The second are so-called Amazon machine images. Amazon machine images, you can create Amazon machine images uh, if you'd like. So I'm going back to this uh, smile up here and um, to EC2 and I'm in Ohio so I can see all the instances and I can find mine by filtering, AeroCam, whoops. Ah, of course, Neurohack and oh. There you go. And, and then, you know, I can, in actions, I can uh, uh, go to image and create an image. Don't do that because it shuts off the machine at that time. So uh, let's say I went in there, I installed all the software I want, and I have like a, a and, and this is very useful often, let's say you have a bunch of dependencies and you'd like to run something from those dependencies, let's say I have, instead of wanting to run on just this one brain that I had there, I wanted to run something on every brain in the Human Connectome project, I might say, well, let's create 1,113 image machines, and each one would work on one of the brains. So I'd have these software dependencies. I go in, I install my software dependencies on one machine, I create an image out of that machine, and then um, that machine is now, that image is like a virtual machine that I can revive. And I can revive it one time, and I can revive it a thousand times if I need it. So I can get a thousand machines that all have uh, the same state that that machine currently has. I should say the same uh, hard drive state, not the memory state. It doesn't, it doesn't preserve the fact that I just read into memory the, that T1 weighted image in IPython. Uh, so it doesn't preserve kind of the, the running state, but it does preserve the hard drive. So it preserves things like if I downloaded data into it, that data would be there. If I uh, installed some software on it, that software would be in there. And so uh, you can, uh, when you launch an instance, you can ask to launch an instance from an AMI, um, from a, a previously configured Amazon machine image. So that's now you can launch a, a thousand machines and go into each one of them and run on one of the subjects in the Human Connect Home project. And I'll show you in just a few minutes how you can avoid logging into each one and running on each subject uh, as well, how you can automate that as well. Yeah? So the uh, AMI is not a Docker? That's right. So the AMI is not a Docker container. That's true. Yeah. The AMI is an Amazon thingy. Presumably they have a file format that stores that but they won't tell you what it is, and so it's uh, vendor lock-in. It really is, I mean, that's classic vendor lock-in right there. Um, so you can only run, if you created a name on Amazon, you can't move that to Google and run it there, which you can do with a Docker image. So Docker images, yes, yeah? So the S3 test is actually used by F1, right? Not just like zero hacker. Because I can actually go into other people and see what, what their files are. So can you actually make it private, like only among the group of people? Oh, so you're, you're on this UW eScience account and you saw that list of S3s and now you're looking into other buckets on that UW eScience account. And that's an account that's shared with other eScience projects. We didn't create a specific account just for this. But you could. I have, for example, for the DiPy project, we have an Amazon S3, our own account, uh, and in there we do our stuff and nobody else can see. But you, yeah, so you can create that, but that's a little bit more, uh, there's a little bit more bureaucracy and that's why we didn't do it for, for this. And, uh, and I mentioned Tara by name in, uh, a few minutes ago and now I'll just point her out and She's back there, so if you want to talk about AWS she, and neuroimaging, she is the, the, the authority. Um, 
Okay, so I'll point out that AMIs, there's, there's many, so there's, there's I, I kind of poo-pooed on them a little bit, but there are really useful AMIs out there that you can use that others have created. I'll point to two that are of interest. Um, one is, uh, if, you deep, if you search for deep learning here, you'll find all kinds of um, machines that have been uh, uh, pre-installed with everything that you need to do deep learning. And that's a, it's a problem because uh, to do deep learning on graphical processing units, you need all kinds of configuration of the graphics drivers, and it's a pain in the neck to install yourself. Uh, there is something called NVIDIA Docker that is like a Docker thing for that, but you can also provision a machine. Uh, that, in, that would mean selecting this instead of selecting the base operating system that we selected before. Another one that I will point out here is uh, the Nitric CE. Well, I'll do Nitric and we'll find oh, three results in the AWS Marketplace. Uh, there we go. So Nitric is the... Neuroimaging imaging something something resource center um, and they they one of the things they do among they, they have a website that has a big uh, directory of different computational resources for for neuroinformatics uh, one of the things they do is is um, manage these um, AWS AMIs and update them and so on and so uh, you can get uh, a light version of that or a slightly heavier one. And this one is already installed with uh, a lot of software that you will want to use when you're doing neuroimaging data analysis, like software that's a little bit harder to install, like FSL and FreeSurfer and so on. So the software that's big and, and heavy and, and requires time to do. Yeah? Right, let me go back and show that again. Uh, so uh, in AWS, going to uh, EC2, um, and then when I click on launch instance, uh, the thing that per default shows up are these base operating systems. And we chose Ubuntu and, and went from there on. But if instead I search for, I can go to my AMIs, which will show me the AMIs that I have created out of my machines. But there's also the AWS marketplace that contains AMIs that you can pay for. Um, and there's community AMIs, which are AMIs that others have created that you don't need to pay for. And Nitric is actually in the, I believe it's in the, I think it's in the marketplace category. There's community, there's community AMIs. Apparently, people have taken their their AMI and created uh, AMIs that they've then shared with the community, which is neat. Uh, but these are, uh, I think, uh, if you go and click on more info, it'll tell you things like, well, let me select that and see what it says. Uh, I guess, yeah. So it'll tell you. Um, over there on the right, it'll tell you, oh, it's zero for the software. Never mind. I thought you pay for the, but in some cases, in these, commu in these marketplace AMIs, you pay for, for the provisioning of the software. They, you pay for if you're creating something. Oh, sorry. I'll make that. I don't think that works. I can make it bigger. Uh, yeah, this is the size it is. But you can see it tells you what it has on it. It has 3D Slicer and Afni and Ants and BrainSuite and lots of software. So, so this, is pretty, this is pretty great. You can provision a machine that has all this software. And if the software itself requires a license, for example, so some companies will create software that requires a, a license, that the, so that, that will be where you're paying here for, for the software. And then in this case, it's nothing. And then it'll tell you how much it costs to provision different instance types with this software. So this is another way to get the computational environment ready to go um, from the get-go. Trying to think what's the next logical thing to do. Do, 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 do. I think I'll, I'll go to sort of the last thing that I meant to show you, which is uh, Yeah, I'll, so there's, so you, you can continue to work in here and do a lot of different things. One of the things that you might want to do is um, access data sets that are in S3 already. Um, for example, the Human Connectome project has all of its data in S3, and, and Noah showed you how to access that. Um, if your data is in S3, 
So here's part of the story. If the data is in S3, then it costs nothing to transfer that data from S3 into another machine, in, in a, a machine in EC2. If you take it out of Amazon's cloud, whoever owns that S3 bucket is now paying what are called egress costs. So this is the, the part of the business model of, part of Amazon's business model is the following idea. If you put stuff into S3, people will pay you money to get stuff out of S3. For example, if you put a lot of videos in there, if you're Netflix and you put videos in there, somebody's gonna pay you every time that they take stuff out of there. And so S Amazon charges people like Netflix every time that somebody takes something out because they know that they're sort of taking their cut. It's, it's not, um, they're not, that, that's where the, the large charges come from. And so when you're storing data in the cloud, it is uh, beneficial for you, and this is also another thing that works out just fine for AWS, it's beneficial for you to also do your compute in AWS because you're not gonna pay the, these egress charges if your compute is next to the data. It's also faster because you don't have to, if the data is very, very big, you don't have to move that data through some wireless connection onto your laptop, right? Um, or, yeah, or through some wire from the thing that we did the other day when, uh, when Noah was demonstrating neuropathy is we were taking data from the human connectomes <laughs> S3 bucket and using uh, neuropathy we were copying it to Google's cloud where our Jupyter Hub lives and, and dumping it there and doing the compute over there. So if you do the compute in, inside of, of AWS, that's faster and that's cheaper. And so you might want to then uh, get the data down here. And so I'll, 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 I won't go in, in detail into the, the, um, the, um, the configuration of this because this, this will take time. And there is one more thing that I, I'd like to show before we wrap up. Um, but I'll, I'll just mention that there is a, the, a, the AWS, the HCP, the Human Connectome Projects, um, data lives in AWS S3, LS, S3, uh, HCP, open access. And when I do that, I will see nothing because I haven't configured this machine with my uh, HCP uh, credentials. So I'll just show you how you might do that. AWS uh, configure will then ask me for an AWS access key ID and an AWS secret access key and it will ask me for the default region name and this is where you want to type uh, US East oops, uh, 2 like that with a dash oh, look at that default output format none and and I didn't enter anything here but this is where you would act you would enter the the credentials that you got from the human connectome project and if you did that when you type uh, AWS s3 ls s3 colon slash slash HCP open access it would then give you a list of all the things that are inside the HCP bucket and you could copy those down the same way that we copied from uh, from the bucket that you did have access through the IAM role that, that Amanda said. Okay, yeah. That's right. So if we configure for the HTTP and then we want to access the that we can do that configure again with the Fair enough. Um, so there's the notion in, in AWS of uh, inside the configuration you can set different profiles. Um, trying to think how I can do this without showing you credentials. Uh, easy. Uh, okay, let me uh, carefully bring this onto the screen. Uh, so you, the, when you do this, you will have, uh, I believe, AWS, an AWS directory, a hidden directory called AWS, and uh, inside there, there's a config, and you can see the config only has the region, but um, if you configured also the keys, you'd have like region equals something, and then key equals something, and then secret key 
equals something, and then you might have a, a, a configuration or profile for the default, and then another one for HCP, and then you would, instead of doing AWS S3 LS with that, you would do dash dash profile HCP, like that. So you'd, you'd sort of build the file with all your different uh, keys in there and, and use that profile. Yeah, but, but that, indeed that complicates matters a little bit. Um, okay, what other questions do you have at this point? Okay, so, you know, there are, there are a couple of different, you might want to experiment with these, with these things later in, in the hackathon. One of the things uh, t tomorrow at this time I will be talking about uh, deep learning and uh, one of the things you might want to experiment with is various algorithms for deep learning and that works really well when you have graphical processing units on the machine that you're running on and it just really is slow and painful when you don't. Um, and we don't have gra graphical processing units on the Jupyter Hub. So one of the ways that you can do that is by provisioning uh, GPU instances on, on AWS. Um, uh, you know, finding this deep learning, um, and then finding the right AMI, we can talk about which one is, and then finding a GPU instance in there and, and running your stuff on that GPU instance. So that's, that's one thing you might want to do. Another thing you might want to do is, is, well, I told you you can do something like run the same thing on um, multiple subjects in the Human Connectome project in parallel, and there's, there's, a, there's a particularly neat service from AWS called AWS Batch um, that lets you run batch processing. So batch processing is similar to what you might do on a, on a high-performance computing cluster in your institution, and so uh, who here has done something like batch submission on a queue on a HPC cluster? Okay, so you define some job and you, uh, when you do that and you, you type some command that submits that into a queue and, and then it goes into that queue and maybe gets picked up after you know, the simulations from the computational chemists have run and the, uh, I don't know, data analysis from the high energy physicists have run and then yours gets into the queue. And AWS Batch has a similar, has a similar feeling to it. It's, um, if you go into Batch, um, you can, you can register, there's some things in here, you can register some jobs and you can define queues and um, some compute environments maybe in which you're running and then submit into this queue and there's a whole command line interface similar to the command line interface that you saw here um, for operating on uh, um, AWS Batch. But actually, I'm going to tell you about a project, a software project that a uh, student working with me, uh, Adam Ritchie Halford, developed that automates all of that and allows you then to submit into AWS Batch from, say, your laptop. Um, before we do that, however, we'll do what we need to do to uh, get rid of all our cattle. Um, so I will uh, exit this machine. So I'm, I'm leaving this machine and uh, I'm going to take it uh, back and um, get rid of it um, by going um, to the console, clicking on AWS EC2, and then uh, finding my instance in here. Uh, so you, again, I type neuro hack aerochem and you know, if, if I had installed, so, uh, spent like half an hour now installing all kinds of software and I wanted to revive that machine again, I could do one of a few things. I could, I could uh, uh, go here and uh, set the instance state to stop. In that case, what happens is the CPUs in that machine are, are stopping. I can't run any processes on these machines, but the hard, the hard drive is, is retained. I, I keep that hard drive that has the software installed on it and has maybe the data that I downloaded and everything. So that's, that's one thing I could do to and that's nice because I can come back here and I can restart that machine and get back everything again. <clears throat> but it's expensive because I, I pay for that hard drive. And that hard drive costs more than the S3 storage. And it costs more than what it, co co what it would cost to store that as an Amazon machine image. So that's kind of the most expensive pause button that I have here. 
Uh, less expensive pause uh, button is to create this Amazon machine image out of that. And the least expensive option is to go to terminate down here and uh, click on that. And it'll say, oh, hey, that is EBS back. So it's like EBS stands for something block storage, elastic block storage. And that will delete this volume. You're deleting your hard drive now. And I'm saying, yes, let's, let's get rid of that. So, whoops, an error occurred fetching instant data. That was fun. Uh, no, seriously, I want to kill that machine. Uh, I hope I. OK. OK, and then it says instance state terminated. And I, I would like to ask you all to do that so that those machines don't keep uh, running on your end as well, uh, to terminate all your machines as well uh, wherever they are, um, so that yeah, we don't have to. Yes? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You could, you could terminate each other's machines. Yeah. But don't do that. <laughs> Let me do that <laughs> afterwards when I find the, all the trailing machines. Yeah, part of the reason we're in Ohio is that nobody else at eScience seems to be using Ohio. So I know everything in there is, is I, can, I can safely kill uh, everything that's running in there. OK. So having done that, terminating that, I'm now going to switch over to show you how you might run lots of jobs on uh, AWS using Batch. And the, so the project in, in question, this, this software project that I told you about, is called Cloud Knot. Uh, Knot is the, uh, I think it's the collective noun for snakes. So we're going to have a lot of snakes running, a lot of Python processes running in the cloud. Uh, the, the programming interface behind this is you import the library, cloud not as CK, then you define some function. This is any Python function. It has one weird quirk to it. All the import statements for all your dependencies need to be inside the function definition. So if you wrote a Python function, regular Python function, you might write this import statement up here as well. But you shouldn't do that for cloud. If you want to cloud not this, it should be in there. Then um, from the cloud knot library, we initialize an object called a knot. That is the main object that uh, runs this library. Um, and then now once we've uh, actually, uh, let, me, let me run this thing. Let me run this as a demo and then we can see what this looks like. OK, so I have the same code here. OK, I've imported cloud knot. I, uh, I'm defining a function. This function does something not very interesting. It generates some random numbers. And then it does a dot product. Um, the import, important thing here is that the dependencies are important within the uh, function. And then I'm initializing this uh, not. The not takes um, the function itself as input, and then a name, some name for what we want. So I'm calling this random MV prod demo. And then when that happens, uh, my laptop on which this is running, so notice this is running currently on my laptop. My laptop is now talking to AWS through the Python API for AWS, um, registering this function with the batch service. Uh, along the way, in order to do that, it's building a Docker image on my machine that contains all the dependencies. In this case, it's just NumPy. But if I had additional Python libraries in there, it would go and create a Docker image that has all the dependencies on it. And it sends that Docker image to AWS um, as a way to register that this this function with AWS. As you can see, this takes a little while. Um, and then um, down here, I'm submitting jobs to the to AWS batch. I'm creating some inputs for this. Uh, this takes as input some, uh, some number. Uh, so I'm creating a bunch of inputs, 20 inputs. And I'm going to run that function on every one of these inputs. So the, the, the map function. The not itself has a method called map, and that map function means that it will run that function, the function up there, will run on every one of the inputs. It's a sequence. So for example, if I had a function up here with uh, subject IDs in the HCP uh, data set, I could put a list of the HCP subject IDs and then uh, 
that function might download the data into that particular machine from a particular subject and run something on it and then give me back or save back out to S3 some output of, of that processing. Um, so map, mapping means basically taking the function and running it on every one of these. And that happens uh, in parallel. So it, it, the, the batch service makes provisions for me machines so that that can happen in parallel. And so if, for example, I'm doing some intense processing on every one of the subjects in the human connectome project, um, this will take, maybe it'll take an hour to run on one subject, and it could take an hour to run it on the entire data set uh, because of this, of this parallelism. Um, but there's overhead cost, as you can tell. So running it for something as short and silly as that is not a very efficient thing to do, but running it on very long running process. For example, I don't know, I, I, one example, you can build really complicated Docker images. For example, I built a Docker image that had FreeSurfer in it uh, using NeuroDocker, something that, that Satra mentioned, and then ran FreeSurfer over a very large data set with something like 700 subjects uh, using, uh, using this and using Nightpipe, something you'll hear about tomorrow and some of you might know, um, and that ran overnight. So uh, you, can, you can do a lot of work relatively fast. Uh, the nice thing about this is that um, once the job is over, once this returns to you this result, uh, that machine is turned off automatically for you. So there's no, there's no logging into the console and making sure that everything is off kind of operation here. Instead, um, as soon as the job is over, as soon as this function is over and the results are returned or saved into S3 somewhere, um, that machine is turned off and you're paying exactly just for the amount of work that you did in AWS. Yeah? Say what? So the machine will be off if it's terminated? Yeah, yeah, terminated. Yeah. So that's good. Some resources might still be dangling there. There's, it's actually important uh, to, uh, where is it? Where's my mouse? Oh, there it is. Uh, it's important in the end to run a not.clobber. Not.clobber will then go and get rid of all the resources associated with this. Because, for example, I, I told you that it's building a Docker image. <laughs> there, it's done. Hey. Um, it's, it built a Docker image. Along the way, it built a Docker image and sent that Docker image to, to AWS. And I am paying for storing that Docker image on AWS. When I, when I execute not.clobber, that Docker image also gets clobbered. Uh, before I go and clobber this thing, though, let me um, just show you what I got uh, back from this. Uh, so this result, uh, futures, is um, an object of type concurrent futures. That's an API in Python to deal with things that are might happen in the future, like the result coming back to you uh, from AWS. And to actually query this, this object to get back your results, you need to ask for them. So it's going to AWS again to dr drag from it the results. This is taking longer than I thought that it should. Um, but for example, if instead of returning, returning the result here, I, I might, for example, just save that into S3, then as soon as the result is done, um, I might, I might, this whole thing might be over and I can clobber the, the, uh, the knot, which is what I'll do next. Okay, I've, I've run a little bit late, um, so, but we'll have a lot more opportunities to play with this. If you want to do processing over a lot of data, I'd be happy to help you get up and running with, uh, with Cloud Knot. Um, so let's stop here and then we can work on this a lot more later. <laughs>